Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is Fireside Chat, episode 56, Coming Home on Fire. Recorded October 20th, 2014. This is Dan and Matt back with you after what was a hot road swing for the Flames. Matt, did you expect us to come back to town with a 4-2 record on the road trip? Not really. Pleasantly surprised. Oh, it was a nice surprise for sure. I think that uh, the Flames really, I would say, impressed and probably surprised everybody that I've talked to since. They beat some teams that I don't think anyone expected them to beat and uh, played... I would say Flames hockey. To me, when I was watching the games, I was watching the Predators game, and that night I could tell that this team's finally playing the way that Hartley wants them to play, and I think that's what made them successful this trip. Yeah, and you could see with the work ethic that they were definitely committing to Hartley's system. They looked very much similar to how they played last year, and it's good to see that they've rekindled that work ethic again this year. For sure. So since we talked last, the Flames went uh, won three of the last four, which I think we were both predicting they'd win one, maybe two if they were lucky. Um, I was really surprised to see the game that they played against Chicago and the fact they were able to win that one. That was uh, quite amazing to me. Of all the games to lose, the Blue Jackets game is not the one I thought they were going to lose. What about you? Yeah, we typically don't really do that well against Columbus for whatever reason, so I wasn't entirely shocked that we lost there. But, yeah, I wasn't really expecting either the Nashville game or Chicago to be victories. And the other thing I found kind of interesting is the Flames won two back-to-back games, which, as we know, is quite hard to do because the guys get fatigued and all that. So I thought it was really cool that they were able to win two back-to-back on the road. Yeah, and that has a lot to do with having two goaltenders that are well-rested and not having to rely on just one guy back-to-back. No, that's that's definitely true, and I think, as we've talked about, I think that the Flames have one of the, if not the best, tandem in the league this year. I don't think any one goaltender is all that much better than the other, but the fact that we've got two guys that are going to be ready to spell each other off when needed is going to give the Flames a big advantage. Yeah, and you could even see in that Chicago game, Hiller was very well-rested and able to cope with having, what was it, 80 shots directed at him? I know the Flames blocked something like 30 of them, so yeah, you have to be on your toes for that kind of thing. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we'll see teams like even tomorrow night when Tampa Bay comes to town after playing back-to-back, they're generally going to be playing a backup goaltender. And we don't have really a backup. We have a 1A, 1B. So we're going to have that advantage of having a starting caliber goaltender in the net against a a team that's on a back-to-back. Exactly. And I do like the fact that each goaltender is getting the alternate game. Like, there's no confusion. It's, okay, you're starting, now you're starting, and so on. And I think they should keep that going until one of them falls off. I agree. So since we're talking about Hiller, um, what do you think of Jonas Hiller in what we've seen from him so far? Is he the Jonas Hiller that was made famous with the Ducks, or is he a has-been Jonas Hiller in your mind so far? He's definitely improved over even the preseason. He didn't look as sharp during the preseason as he does now, so it's good to see that he's pushing himself to get better. And I think having Kari Ramo, who is playing at the top of his game, there ready to take the spot if he falters is a good motivational tool for Hiller. And vice versa. I think having Hiller there is a great motivational tool for Ramo. Yeah, I can't argue with you there. So as of the time that we're recording this on Monday the 20th, the Flames currently sit 5th in the West, which... After I saw how many wins we got, I had to go check NHL.com because that's not something I expect to be saying uh, anytime this season. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that last year we also got off to a hot start because our conditioning and level of work ethic was significantly higher than most teams. 
So the real test will come in November when other teams start getting up to speed. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too because for a long time this team was well known for slow starts. I mean, for a long time the Flames would win. I remember I think one year they lost almost every game in October. And, you know, Jerome wouldn't get going until Christmas and this was a team that was known to get a slow start. So I like the fact they're kind of turning that around and getting some points early that might be able to help them down the road. Exactly. And it might not be necessarily great for this year, but moving forward, if like once they start developing players and getting all the Bennetts and Poiriers in the lineup, then having that ability to get off to a hot start will be more important when they are actually pushing for a playoff spot with some regularity. Yeah, and like you said, it's the conditioning. A lot of um, players who play for the team now have said that that's one of the things that Hartley focuses on a lot in the preseason is the conditioning and getting these guys to where he wants them to be. So I think that there's that's something that can – it's going to make for a tough camp and guys probably to get more tired and injury-prone during the preseason, but it's only going to help you as soon as the regular season starts. Can't argue with you there. So let's talk about two of the uh, storylines from this road trip. Now the Flames are back from their six-game road swing. First one was their first recall of the season, and a player that at the beginning of preseason I wouldn't have thought of as the first recall after his preseason performance. I think it was natural. Josh Juris got called up um, and got his first NHL goal in his first game. What did you think of his performance? He played as he did in the preseason he was notable and quite effective which is somewhat surprising for someone that wasn't really heralded coming into the training camp at all yeah no I, I thought Juris looked good for a guy in his first game I mean he obviously wasn't the best guy on the ice um, I thought it was good that he got a goal I think it was a great reward for his fantastic preseason and it's too bad it couldn't have happened in front of Calgary fans of the dome but you know a goal is a goal well, he did get it in front of his friends and family, so that's important. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a guy like that, your friends and family are going to be there wherever your first game is. True. It's just disappointing that he ended up getting hurt in the same game. Well, let's talk about that. So, Juris got hurt. What was the injury, Matt? I believe it was an upper body injury. That's all I've heard, too. I didn't know if we got any more clarification. Yeah, if I recall correctly, it was a shoulder thing, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, I just heard upper body. I didn't know if anyone had any clarification. Do we know how long Juris will be out? It's not that bad. He was doubtful for the game against Winnipeg, but even the fact that it was a remote possibility means that it shouldn't be that long term. So we may see him suit up against the Lightning this week or um, the Hurricanes or the Capitals. But, yeah, if it's if it was possible that he'd be suiting up for the last game, he'll probably be back in the lineup this week. Yeah, I would be more leaning towards the Capitals game than sooner. You know, I mean, I don't know what the staff looks like in Adirondack, but I imagine for a guy to get hurt, it's probably better to have him here on the Calgary roster. I imagine that Calgary has a better medical staff than Adirondack does. So that's probably going to help him heal a bit quicker as well. Yeah, more facilities and all that. More facilities, more staff, more access to pro doctors. I imagine there's a lot more higher-end doctors in Calgary than in Adirondack. Can't argue with you there. But, yeah, no, I was. I really liked what we saw from Josh Juris. I was worried when I saw that he got called up that his preseason might have been a flash in the pan and we might not see that from him and he'd look like the old Josh Juris, the AHL fill-in guy Josh Juris. But I was glad in the one game we saw of him to see that he carried over his fine form. and um, Well, he didn't look in over his head. and that's, No, he didn't. And that's an important thing. Like You don't want to have guys come up and then and get like the Tim Ramholt experience where 45 seconds shift and that's it for your NHL career. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. Um, he didn't look overwhelmed he wasn't the best guy on the ice he wasn't the worst guy on the ice but he looked like he'd keep up with the play exactly and that's all you need from rookie call-ups especially when they're in their nhl debut so juris got called up over some of the guys who a lot of people thought would be the first call up guys like sven berchi michael furland uh granlin do you think first off juris is going to stay here 
for any length of time, or do you think he has a short-term uh, recall while Jones is hurt? I think he's just here for the short term while Jones is on the shelf. The reason why I believe they didn't call Berchi or Furland or any of the other guys up was more to do with allowing those guys to get prime ice time. Because I know Juris, he can manage being a third, fourth line ice time type guy. Well, that's what he's used to in the AHL. Exactly. And where you want guys like Furland and Grandland and Berchi to get 20 minutes a night and develop. And having them here for 7 to 10 minutes a night isn't really going to help them too much. Yeah, no, that that's a good way to think about it. I hadn't really thought about it, but especially this early in the season where we just saw these guys in preseason, we're not that far removed from the Calgary staff evaluating them. I could see if it was, you know, December, January, somewhere in there, maybe bringing these players up to take another look at them and give them seven minutes a night. But, yeah, I think at this point, Josh Juris showed, like you said, that he can play at the NHL level and not get lost. He's a guy that they know they can play that many minutes and it's not going to stunt his development. And I guess even if it does, I know this is probably a bad thing to say, but it's not like he was a player we are relying on for the future. He's a happy accident almost. Yeah. yeah, okay, we've got this guy, he's looking good, let's, you know, use him, let's see what we really have there, and almost put it to the test, and see if this is a guy we build into our future plans, or if he's almost like a, a David Moss, who came up, got a call up, looked good, and then just kind of became another run-of-the-mill NHLer. Well, even if Juris becomes a run-of-the-mill NHLer, that, that would be far exceeding, I think, anybody's expectations when we signed him. So, That's true. <laughs> you know... It's one of those things that you have to reward good work, and Juris was probably the most improved player in the organization, so giving him a thumbs up and the opportunity to make his NHL debut is a good positive reinforcement that if you work hard, you will get rewarded. Juris is also an older guy. He's 24. Uh, I think that makes him older than everyone else um, on the list that we talked about, Berchi, Ferland, and Granlin. So, you know, it might be kind of rewarding the older guys too and letting the younger guys stay down there and prove themselves a bit more. True, but uh, he is only in his second year of uh, professional hockey, so it's not like he's an experienced veteran, so to speak. Even yeah, that's though- a good point. Yeah, he played for Abbotsford last year, 73 games, and before that he was at Union College. So, yeah, no, you're right, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of experience at this level. Another storyline from the road trip was Johnny Gaudreau, Johnny Hockey, who made the team out of camp. We've talked about this in previous episodes, but we were both surprised he made the team out of camp. Didn't expect him on the opening day roster, and I think it's fair to say that he struggled so far this season. Do you think that's a fair estimation? Yeah, by and large, I mean, he is okay, but for the type of player that he is, he didn't live up to his own expectations, I don't think. Yeah, I think that he struggled based on where the Flames have expected him to be with his development at this point. I think it was Brad Treliving that said about him in the preseason, with Johnny Gaudreau, we know what we have when he's got the puck. We have no idea what we have when he doesn't have the puck because he's so used to always playing hockey with the puck on his stick. So I think that's partly what the Flames have been trying to figure out is what they had there. And additionally, he's also not getting the ideal matchups because he's been on the road. So it's kind of hard to make adjustments when you're always going to be up against likely the other team's best defenseman because really he is Calgary's main offensive threat. Yeah, but that's going to happen in half your games every year. Oh, I know, but it's a lot more difficult when it's your first week of your career versus, you know, like, say, like, five years in. Yeah, no, no, that's true. I think any rookie's going to struggle a bit that way. Exactly. So Gaudreau got benched, um, well, not benched, Gaudreau was scratched for the Columbus game um, against the Blue Jackets. He didn't play in the lineup, and that surprised a lot of people that they sat him down for a game. Um, but then we saw him come back in the game after that, the Winnipeg game, and get his first NHL goal. 
So I, I don't. It was his first of the season. He scored one last year. Oh, okay. There. So his first of his it, season. That's right. Sportsnet's been making the same error. So I, well, I'll I, give I it to you. I forgot they even played last year because he played what one game? Yeah, the very last one. Yeah. So there you go. So his first goal of the year is second NHL goal. And I don't know that one necessarily has to do with the other. I don't know that, you know, by sitting him in Columbus, it made him any better, any hungrier in Winnipeg. But it's nice to see that he's got that goal now. And I feel like that's a hurdle for him. He's a guy who's on this team to produce points. And now having that goal, I feel like maybe there's a weight lifted off his shoulder and it's going to be easier for him to continue scoring from here. Well, it's also a positive to see how he responded from being scratched instead of, like, say, pouting and, like, oh, they scratched me, you know. Very similar to what we got when Sven Berchi got sent to the HL last year. Yeah, and he instead was analyzing his own game and he was trying to pick out some things because he said he was working on it. And that was actually the Mason Raymond goal. He made some adjustments to his game for the Winnipeg game. And that's how that goal kind of came about. So seeing that he's willing to take the time off, learn and make adjustments instead of pouting is a very good thing. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think... I think more what that comes down to is kind of that star attitude. Maybe it's because he's not a first-round pick, but it seems like a lot of these guys who are picked very high overall have this, and I don't want to say all of them, but you see a lot of stories in the media about these guys who are picked first overall thinking they're entitled to being treated a certain way or playing so many games or something like that. And yeah, it seems like he's saying, okay, I'm a team player. I'll sit. I'll take the game off because that's what's needed of me. And he's still able to come back and have a great game after that. Like you said, he's not upset or refusing to play or anything like that. Yeah, he's motivating himself. And he was a lot better in the Winnipeg game, more like what we saw in the preseason. And that's more of what you need from him, not what we saw in the first five games. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think if he can keep playing the way he did in Winnipeg, now that he knows he's got that kind of game in him, we're going to see nothing but great things from him this season. Yeah, I, I think that was getting on the right page. Yeah, I think that's the game now that the video coaches are going to play back for him anytime that they think he might you know, be losing his step a little bit and say, this is where we need you. We know you can do it because you've done it. Get back to here. Mm-hmm. Um, another guy that I was kind of surprised to see him doing so well on the road was Mason Raymond. I think that we saw, I saw from Raymond, I mean, we know that he had his uh, hat trick earlier this year against the uh, Oilers, but he got, I think, two or three goals on this road trip. And to me, he was a guy that every game I was seeing him out there doing the right thing. There was very few times, I can't even, I think I can think of one where I saw Mason Raymond not doing the right thing. Yeah, I've actually been quite impressed by how he's performed thus far. I full value signing thus far i don't see anything in his game that's overly weak he's not going to be a 30 goal scorer mind you but no but nor do we need him to be this year no but he's just a, a really solid second line winger and he's doing a good job i no complaints for me whatsoever yeah no i i think that he's like you said for the value of what we paid for him i think we're getting good value for him so far and I think that he's, uh, I mean, he's on track to have a good season. So far in seven games, he's got pretty much a point a game, five goals, two assists. So obviously he's probably not going to keep up, you know, point a game uh, numbers. It'd be great if he did. I'd love for him to get 82 points, but uh, not on a team like this. And I think what we're going to see is different guys hot at different times this year. So it's great that we can kind of ride Mason Raymond while he's hot. And hopefully he will continue that during the next homestand. Exactly. And like while he's hot right now, a guy like Sean Monahan's on the cold side, so maybe in the next week or two you see them alternate where Raymond suddenly starts going cold and Monahan picks it up. Who knows? Yeah, well and I think if they can constantly do that throughout the year, you know, maybe then Monahan goes on a bit of a hot streak and he cools down and Hoodler goes on one. We're always gonna have some offensive production then. Where we're screwed this year is if everyone gets cold all at once. 
yeah, sort of like around Christmas time last year where we couldn't buy a goal to save our life. Exactly. We've got all the cap room in the world, but we couldn't buy ourselves a goal. So, Matt, one of the keys that you pointed out to success on the road was the uh, face-off improvements for the Flames over the past season. And you've been doing some analyzation of that. What have you found? Well, uh, the main improvement has been from Sean Monahan and Michael Backlund, our top two centers. Last year, uh, Sean Monahan only won 45.9% of his draws. And thus far this season, he's up to 528 and Backlund only won 47.5 last year and is just over 50% at 50.3. So that improvement helps uh, the Flames control the puck more. And it's one of those things that it's not that big of a deal. Like Even over the course of a season, you're talking maybe like 40 draws difference, one versus loss. But... It's one of those little things that maybe you score a goal that's needed from that, and that might be the difference between making the playoffs and not down the road. So having that is a good thing, and that's been an area where the Flames have really struggled in since really the last decade at least, if not longer. Well, I know last year I went to, you know, a handful of games, and I remember seeing so often where the Flames would be in the offensive end, they'd have a face-off, they'd lose it, and everyone would have to go back, you know, because they don't want to uh, offside, everyone would have to go back out in the neutral zone and back in. You waste a lot of time then. So if you can keep those face-off wins high, you're going to get more puck possession time, especially if you can get more puck possession time in the offensive zone. Even if you're not scoring a lot more, you're getting a lot more goals and creating chances that, like you said, will eventually come to be more goals overall. Yeah, and it also helps, like, say you're on the power play, to not have 15 to 20 seconds burnt because the other team won the faceoff and the puck's all the way down in your end. So if you can consistently win those draws, then you can keep the pressure up and keep it on and maybe score a power play goal that way instead of wasting 20 seconds or more. Yeah, I mean, it lets you control the game and you can decide what you want to do with the puck at that point. Mm. And especially because the Flames are more of a puck possession type team, it, that's more beneficial for their style. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right. If anyone's interested in seeing face-off stats, if you go to the Flames website and go to the box score of any game, on the right-hand side, under official game reports, you can actually see a face-off report there, and it'll show you each centerman, not only how many he won, but how many face-offs he won the offensive, defensive, and neutral zone. So it, if you're interested in more of these stats, they're all on the Flames site, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's a good resource yeah, not everyone's going to be interested in digging into it, but when you mentioned you want to talk about this, I've been looking at them this week, and it's interesting to see, like in the Winnipeg game, for example, Monaghan won 80% of his faceoffs in the offensive zone, um, but only 17% in the neutral zone. So, you know, kind of interesting there. I would rather be winning in the offensive zone, and it not only shows that, it shows which centerman he was against every time, too, which is really cool. That's a really awesome breakdown. And I, yeah, I didn't is. even know about this, so no. I'm learning about it for the first time as well, and that's actually quite cool. There's a hidden gem there. No one's going to want to do all of these uh, all of these things themselves, all this kind of analysis, but some guy at the NHL is being paid to, so we might as well go and look it up. Yeah. They also have a really cool thing in the same page on the sidebar there under uh, Shot Report, where you can see the same type of thing, which player made a shot, if it was even strength, power play, or shorthanded and which period they they took the most shots, that sort of thing. So I think a lot of people just go and look at the um, just go and look at the box scores, but there's actually a lot of information the NHL provides, official information, that you can go in and really break down if you want to see some of these. So I mean, yeah, the Flames probably employ some guy and this is his job is to look through these and say, okay, you know, you gotta win more face offs against X guy or Y guy, but if somebody wants to see some information here, it's all right there on the Flames website. So, yeah, no, I agree. I've seen more so far face-off wins, and I think because of that, the Flames have had the first few seconds of control, 
which lets them make a decision that they couldn't otherwise, right? It lets them decide if they want to pass or shoot. It's their puck to lose at that point. And I think that part of the reason they were successful on the road, as you mentioned, is because they're winning more faceoffs. Well, it makes the other team have to work as well because, okay, I have the puck, come get it. <laughs> yeah, it makes the other team have to work and it makes the other team have to, you know, spend more energy trying to get that puck away from you. Exactly, and like you can burn a uh, line's shift just by having control of the puck. So if you win a face-off, say, against Taves' line, well, he his line might not be able to rec- get control of the puck before they have to go off for a change. So you can, if you're controlling the play, it's a lot easier. Yeah, especially on power plays or penalty kills. It becomes even more important because you can burn... You know, a good chunk, you could burn almost a quarter of a two-minute penalty if you can control that puck and even keep it in the neutral zone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think in the past it's been frustrating with how few face-offs the team was able to win. I remember a couple years ago they were having such horrible luck in the circle. I guess not luck. It's not luck. It's skill. But that the Flames actually brought Conroy back to work with the centers at at practice just to show them how to win face-offs. Um, I think that was, what, not last year, but the year before, I think? Yeah, something like that. So it's good to see that that's... I don't know if they're practicing it or not. I haven't been doing practice this year, but it's good to see that it's improving, and hopefully it's improving because they're practicing it. Well, ever since the Flames acquired uh, Corbin Knight off of Florida, I've noticed that the ability of the defen- or of the centers to take face-offs has improved. Uh, he's renowned for being one of the top face-off guys period so if that skill rubs off on the rest of the players then that trades a win even if Corbin Knight doesn't make the NHL well and that's interesting too that you're kind of pinpointed to when he came because he's not even in the NHL so for them to get better from a guy who's not playing on the active roster well they do practice all off season, I'm assuming with each other or yeah, I don't know if they all practice together. I think sometimes you'll hear about guys who practice with guys from other teams. Still, but can't you know, hurt. I'm, no, and I'm sure he can funnel some of that knowledge up the chain with the coaching staff as well. Mm-hmm. You know, here's an I was taught that sort of thing. Yeah, this is how I win it, and little yeah. strategies and all that. So exactly, it's good. Um, another thing that was that you'd mentioned here is that so far this season, the goaltending and the defense are looking better than we were expecting. Yeah, I, I've been rather shocked, actually, at how good our defense has been. Well, I think that's a, a key. I mean, if you look at the 4-2 and two record, that's definitely a key there. Um, we haven't necessarily always played the better game in some of those games, but yeah, I agree. The defenses look great, and... I think even when they did on the defense what they did with Johnny Goudreau where they sat Weidman for a game, I thought he too was able to respond well coming back after being sat. So, you know, that might have had some motivation there as well. Yeah. And, you know, like when we saw the Chicago game, like Chicago wasn't actually that good in that game despite having a ridiculous amount of shots. Because the Flames' defense was easily able to keep them to the outside, and they weren't really getting that many good scoring chances. They were just firing the puck on the net all the time. Yeah, no, I think that's a good way to put it. And we've seen that not just the Chicago game, but yeah, they're able to keep uh, teams to the outside. They're playing almost textbook defensive hockey. And it's working well Mm -hmm. for them. Well, it doesn't hurt when you have TJ Brody and Mark Giordano out there, who's one of the top five defense pairings in the league. Those two have really come into their own as a pairing, haven't they? Yeah, I'm actually amazed at how good they've become. Like, If you would have said even three years ago that not only would Brody and Giordano be the top pairing, but like they'd be one of the top five pairings in the league i would have thought you were smoking something well, i remember when we had the keith seabrook pairing in uh in chicago a couple of years ago that was really hot for a while and again that was a pairing i didn't think was a likely tandem but it worked and i think it's great that we have brody out there working so well with uh geo because geo's got a lot of knowledge to pass on yeah and the good thing is is that each of them is young enough that they should both be very good still while when the Flames are 
coming out of their rebuilding phase. Yeah. Because, like, even if uh, the Flames are rebuilding, per se, for the next two or three years, like, Jordan is only going to be, what, 32, 33? He's 31 right now. Yeah. So So he'll be in his mid-30s. Yeah, and usually a defenseman like that's good till 37, 38. Like, if you look at uh, Dan Boyle... Well, a lot of defensemen aren't even peaking until 31, 32 these days. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you look at Dan Boyle, like, he's still a fairly decent defenseman for the Rangers now. So, and he's, like, 40. So, I don't see Geo cooling off to that extent in the next couple of years. No. And it was made official today, while we're talking about TJ Brody, that uh, TJ Brody has signed a new contract with the Flames. He's in his the last year of his current deal. And today he signed a five-year contract with the Flames. It's estimated to be worth about $4.6 million per year. So he's one of the few guys on the team that I would want to sign a five-year deal with at this point because he's still not even going to be 30 by the time that that contract expires. And at $4.6 million, I think we're getting a bargain on this guy. Yeah. Uh, well, anytime you can lock up the current NHL point leader amongst defensemen for $4.6 million, Eh, it's not bad. Geo's or sorry, Brody's making uh, two point one two five million this year, so about two point one million. So it's quite a raise. But if you look at guys in the team, which you know comparable contracts, Weidman's making five point two five. Uh, Smeed's making three point five. Geo's making four point, not so four million, pretty much. So I think if you compare him to Geo, who if we're looking at them as a one two pairing. For Gio to be making $4 million right now, he'll get a raise after next year. And Brody to be making four point six, I think that's about in line with where we'd want to see our top pairing for the future. Yeah, and honestly, like even if, uh, say, Giordano re-signs for $7 million, only spe- spending like $11.5 million on your top pairing is actually ridiculously cheap if you look around the league. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I think that that's a great uh, great signing there. I'm glad the Flames got it done early. I know often players don't want to negotiate during the year um, when they're playing, but I'm really happy that that's done, and I think that that weight comes off a lot of people's shoulders now. Yeah, and the good thing is, is with that having such a low average value per year, once guys like Monaghan and Berchi and Gaudreau and Bennett need to get their second contracts... We shouldn't be having much difficulty with the cap later on. So that's also a positive. And that's more like year four and five of that contract. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, it it's probably very tempting for the Flames to say, let's just give him whatever he wants because we got all the money in the world. But you're right. We have to look long term. And if we look at 2019-2020 uh, when this contract expires, by that point, the Flames should be on an upward trajectory unless something's gone wrong with this rebuild um so i think by that point you're right to have a guy who could be one of the premier defensemen in the league locked up at four and a half million the flames are gonna look like geniuses i just hope he keeps improving yeah and even if he doesn't oh I mean, no even if he doesn't it's a great contract it's for... a great contract and an easily movable contract if it needs to be mm-hmm I mean, if there's rumors that the Flames were able to move Weidman's contract, which has been rumored for a couple of years at 5.2, pretty much I think any team would be a buyer for Brody. 4.2 million is fairly easy to find cap room for. So, yeah, it's good that he got uh, locked up there. The defense, um, we're talking about how they're looking strong so far. Brody and Giordano definitely looking like the top defensemen on um on our back end, our back seven. Who do you think looks like they're struggling, if anybody, so far this year? Well, in the first couple of games, Dennis Weidman was notably bad, and like he did get benched for that one game. And Rafael Diaz was good when he first came in, but last night was absolutely dreadful, and he got benched from like the first period through the rest of the game. So... Guys are going to have ups and downs with, yeah. And you got to remember that, like, our three, four, five, six, and seven guys are really, th- like, four through seven defensemen. And 
that there's a reason why they're not like number three and number two guys. They have holes in their games, and sometimes they're gonna not be very good, and that's fine. You know, it, you can't have six Brodies, even though like that would be awesome. <laughs> so it is what it is, and you can't really complain too much. You just hope that they perform as good as they can. I think to me the guy, and I wasn't expecting a lot coming into the season from him, but so far the one defenseman I guess who I've noticed doing the the wrong thing or the thing he shouldn't be doing more often is Derek England. I haven't been impressed so far from what we've seen in England compared to his six compatriots on the blue line. I think that England has looked, I, I don't want to say the worst, but perhaps the guy who's not really fitting in so far maybe just needs a little bit more time to figure out his role on this blue line um, or figure out his defensive partners, where he's going to fit, that sort of thing. But England so far I haven't been impressed with. To me, he's just been an okay number six. If you don't look at what he's actually getting paid, he's actually doing fine for the role he's in. Like, If you look at like our past number six guys, a lot of them, quite frankly, sucked. <laughs> like Guys like Zuzan and Erickson and that. So how do we keep getting such crappy defensemen on this team? Uh, it's gone back even to the early '90s when we had Trent Yanni and guys like that. So five, six defensemen are usually not very good unless you're a Stanley Cup caliber team, and that's usually why you're a Stanley Cup caliber team. <laughs> I guess of all the guys on the roster that I was expecting to be sitting in the press box, if they did decide to bring up a young player, I wasn't expecting it to be England when the season started. And looking at the defensive um, team now, or the defensive group, I guess, if I wanted to try out a new player right now, England would be the guy that I'd be sitting. Um, I'd give him a lot, lot more time than like how many ever games plus I think he's been out with injury for a bit as well so yeah I mean I'm not saying all season but if there's you know one player that's looking exceptional in Adirondack and you said let's give this guy a look if I have to take one player out of lineup to do that right now it's England oh yeah it would be him yeah and I can't argue with you there Um, but yeah I mean it's still early we'll see how they come around but I think you're right about the money on England England's looking like what we'd expect England to look like but for the money we're paying him, he's not looking like he's living up to that, which, honestly, I never expected him to. It was a move to get to the salary floor, and we weren't expecting England to be a you know a top three defenseman on this team, or even a top four. No, and that was literally a cap floor solution, which is, which is necessary, so... And even then, he's not totally overpaid. It's not like we're paying this guy $7 million. Um, we're paying Derek England two point nine, so almost $3 million for three years. So if you look at some of the, the other contracts on this team, that's not too bad. No, and realistically, he's only overpaid by about a $1 million, so it's not even the end of the world at that rate. If we're paying Derek, David Jones $4 million, there's no reason we can't pay England $3 million. Exactly. Scary to think that our highest paid forward is David Jones and our highest paid uh, defenseman is Dennis Weidman. <laughs> yeah, I know. On on most teams, that would probably get a GM fired. Well, in Jones's case, it did. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that uh, that costs some, some jobs. I think more than one job over in Colorado. Yeah, and feasters. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well... And do we know what Jones's current injury is or how long he's out? Nope. I haven't seen any news about yeah, him. Yeah, I don't know. I, he seems to get hurt a lot for random things. Yeah, he does. It seems like he's hurt more often than he's not. He, he's almost become like the next Rick DiPietro. Yeah, and it's not like it's the same injury over and over again. Because then, oh, well, it's his leg again or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, for a guy making $4 million I'm, and a guy who doesn't really need to prove anything at this point, there's probably no rush to get back on the ice. I don't I mean, I want to speak for him or anything, but, yeah, I think that that's probably going to hinder him down the road when it comes to contract negotiations if you're playing less games than you're sitting throughout the year. Sure. So, Matt, um, Flames are off to a decent start. 
I guess the Calgary Flames, but the Adirondack Flames not so much. Do you want to give us a report of what's going on in Adirondack? Yeah, I've watched every game. I bought that AHL Live package so I can actually watch the games. And if you haven't, it's actually quite entertaining hockey. Uh, And I've also found that the streaming quality has been pretty good too in the two games I've watched so far. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not high def by any stretch, but it's watchable. Yeah. Well, and I think part of that, if you look at a lot of where the markets for AHL hockey are, there's a lot of people that wouldn't have high-speed internet like we do here in Calgary. We're very fortunate that way, so I would never expect high def from the AHL. No. And in the five games they've played, they've only won once, which was their last game uh, against the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, the former Adirondack Phantoms. The first three games were very much like the Chicago-Calgary game where we couldn't get the puck out of our own end. And add that to some subpar goaltending from both Ordeo and Thessian, and that's why we lost those three games quite handily. 5-1, 6-1, and 4-2. Offensively, though, the team is getting a lot of good offensive chances. They've just been running into some decent goaltending and that happens like if you look at the stat sheet Sven Berchi has zero goals zero assists and is a minus four in the five games and yet he's actually been the most dynamic offensive player for Adirondack and if you didn't see the games you wouldn't notice that yeah and and I mean this is a new franchise Um, it has a lot of players on this team that have never played together, really, along with a new coach who's trying to impart his system. So I was kind of expecting a little bit of a bump in the road at the beginning of the year Um, while this team's coming together. It's very similar to, like, an expansion team in the NHL where they got to bring together a bunch of pieces with a new coach and make things work. Um, I think that I've seen... From the two games I've seen so far, there's definitely potential there. It's not like this team's going to be a stinker all year. But yeah, I think that once they get their stride going and get the you know start doing what Calgary did on this road trip of figuring out their system and playing it, this team's going to start looking really good. Yes, and like in the first few games, like uh, Watherspoon, he wasn't in the lineup because he was still recovering from that injury and that he suffered in training camp. And since he's come back, the defense core has settled down significantly. And a lot of that has to do with guys like Mark Kandari and Nolan Yonkman, and I can't remember the guy's first name, but Stevenson. I think it's Derek, but whatever. Uh, Those guys are not very good defensively, and so they were getting too much ice time, and now with Watherspoon coming back, that kind of pushes everybody down a rung on the ladder. Yeah, moving down one spot on the depth chart, so the last guy gets pushed out of active duty. Yeah, and because of that, the defense core overall has improved, and with that, the Flames are having control of the puck more, so the guys like Granlund, Furland, Berchi, Reinhardt, Augustino, like, they can actually go up the ice and try and actually score goals instead of reacting to what's going on in their own zone. And that's always important. Yeah. It's one of those things that if you were looking at, like, the raw scoring chances in each game, like, each one of them should have been a one-goal game. It's just that in the first few games, subpar goaltending plus getting hemmed in your zone a little too much resulted in the other team scoring, like, 15 goals in the first three games. Yeah. So, you know, that's never good. But those are things that are easy to fix, too. Yeah, and it, they're working on it. And it, the last game was very good, both by the defense and the goaltending. So it's encouraging, because we saw Granlund get a pair of goals in the last game. Furland scored. And like even though guys like Knight, Reinhardt, and Berchi haven't tallied anything yet, 
they're getting their chances as well, so it's coming together. It's just not quite meshing 100% yet. Well, and, and even though they're not getting their chance, I mean, if you look at Granlin, he's one of the few... Granlin and Furland are some of the few guys in this team who are um, sitting at a positive for plus-minus. So you can tell they're doing some of the right things so far, even though they're not... You know, I mean, Granlin's got four points in five games, so it's not like he's doing anything wrong. Oh, no. It's just... On the stat sheet, it might, like, once you get past Furland and Grandland, like, it looks pretty bleak. Yeah, with, it does. Like, everybody being, like, minus four, minus three. Minus five for some of them. Yeah, with zero points or, like, one assist. I think everybody but uh, Furland and Grandland have one or zero points so far. Yeah. So they're the only guys in the team that have more than one point, and neither of them's even doing, like, a point per game, so... Yeah, I think it's just going to take some warming up of this team and uh, see how they're looking. Yeah, and that's just a matter of time. Uh, the team is itself is too good for the results of being 1-4 in, in their first five, so it's just a unfortunate bad streak to start the year. Yeah, I think that we see, we're seeing a slow start, and it's not that a team can't recover from a slow start. We see it all the time. I think part of it, too, from what I've seen when I watched the first couple games that I watched... Players are, and we saw this in training camp too, they're trying to figure out who they are. I think that these players, some of them, are trying to play a different role than they're familiar with on this team. And that's going to take a couple games to adjust to as well. Well, you also have to figure that you've got guys like Augustino, Arnold, Van Brabant, Hathaway, Tusignant, Wolf, all those types of guys that, like, this is their first professional season. And yeah it's a big jump from the NCAA or wherever they came from to come in and get into the second best league in the world. It's a bit of a learning curve. Yep. But I mean, we've got, I'm very confident that the coaching staff that we have there is the right coaching staff to help work those guys through it as well. Oh yeah. And it, the, the games look good. It, Yes, they're not getting the results, but you can see that the talent's there. And that's the most important thing. You're going to have stretches with any team in the year that they're just going to flat out suck for a couple of games. Yeah. Like Even the Stanley Cup champions will always invariably have a three or four game losing streak somewhere along the line where they just can't click properly. And I think for Adirondack, it, unfortunately for them, it was right at the beginning of the year. I think a lot of that, too, could be that most of these guys are coming back from Flames camp and might still be tired or sore from being worked so hard in the Flames camp because we know that Hartley runs a tough camp. Yeah, and that's also a valid point, like with Watherspoon coming back from injury and all that. Yeah. Uh, While we're talking about Adirondack, a couple interesting personnel notes that I found this week. Um, Last year, we know that Craig Conroy was kind of the GM of um, Abbotsford, and when I was looking on the Adirondack side, it looks like Brad Pascal is going to be in charge of the Adirondack team this year. So Conroy will be moved to other duties. And I was also wondering to myself, whatever happened to Troy Ward? I know that we were kind of disappointed last year when he got released by the Flames. And it turns out that he is now the head coach for the Vancouver Giants of the WHL. So he rebounded somewhere. He's a, he's a great development coach. I'm glad that he rebounded somewhere. But I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with Ryan Hushka as the uh, coach right now in Adirondack. I think he's the right fit for what we need. Yeah, I can't argue with that, and I'm glad to see Ward got a job with Vancouver. At least he didn't have to move too far. Well, I think he lives in Wisconsin or something. Well, going from Abbotsford to Vancouver is not that bad. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. And, I mean, he he did wonders. I think we have to give him credit for where credit's due. He did wonders for the Flames uh, prospects. He, I think, developed prospects, some prospects that we didn't think would look like anything, and he really made them better players than we were expecting. So, you know, it's good that he's got another job in development somewhere. I wasn't expecting him to be out of work long, but I was wondering to myself, hmm, what's he doing? And then found out he was in Vancouver, so good for him. Well, Matt, um, Flames are coming home after this hot road streak to a long homestand now. They come back from six games on the road to five games at home um, over the rest of the month. We've got 
Um, on Tuesday, we have the Lightning. Then we've got the Hurricane coming, the Capitals, the Canadians, and the Predators again. So um, of those five, three of them are against, or one, two, three, four of them are against Eastern Conference teams. How do you think the Flames are going to do on this on this homestand based on what we've seen on the road trip now? Well, Carolina, they should probably beat them. Every other game, it's a complete toss-up. It just depends on A, who they're, the other team's starting in net, and B, if the Flames can manage them. Like, I didn't think that we'd beat Chicago, Nashville, and Winnipeg last week, so who knows? <laughs> I think the Flames have a good chance of beating the Lightning because they're going to be on a back to back. Yeah. I think that I think you're right. We're gonna we have to kind of beat the uh, we have to beat the Hurricanes. If you can't beat the Hurricanes, there's some issues there. I think the Capitals are going to give us trouble. I'm not saying we can't beat them, but I think that's going to be a tough game for the Flames. I think the Habs could also give them some trouble, but I I think the Predator. I mean, we've already beat the Predators. They're going to be out for blood, but I think we can do it again. So. I would love to see us go three or even four of the next five as wins, but realistically, I think two would be a good homestand. Yeah. Anytime that you can be a 500 on the homestand, like even if it's like getting an overtime loss in there, that would, to me would be successful. It's one of those things that because it's so early in the season, we don't know if other teams are having issues like Adirondack was. So, mm-hmm. and some of the teams that are starting slow, we don't also know when they're going to start rebounding either. Exactly, and it might be that we're the platform to spring forward. Could be. Who knows? And then we have another five-game road swing after this. This is a really weird start to the season. Yeah, then we have another five-game homestand after that. It's a really bizarre schedule. It's like let's save on air travel. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, you're still traveling for a long time, but I, I really, I haven't looked at the seldom schedule, but I hope that they're making, taking advantage of all these days the Flames are gone. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about tonight? No, I'm good. I, I'm just pleased that the week that was in Calgary, it was very awesome to watch both the Flames and the Adirondack Flames. And I think it's been a good thing to rally the Sea of Red, too. It's been a great week, and people are talking about the Flames again. They're not talking about them because they suck or they can't win a hockey game. They're talking about them for the right reasons. Yeah, it's not like we're having Edmonton-like problems, so that's always good. Yeah, and I, I think after the first couple games this year, people were um, talking about us for the wrong reasons. And I think now this city's starting to rally around the team again, which I think is, is great news. Well, hard work that is infectious, and even though the scoring might not be at where we'd like it to be, the work is definitely appreciated. And that was what we knew the Flames' identity was going to be this year. I mean, we knew they had to be a hard-working, blue-collar team, if you will. Yeah, and I have to give a big thumbs up to Lance Boma last game for blocking four shots on that one penalty kill. That was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. With a, a broken face, as Hartley said, after that the game. That guy's going to be sore after that. Oh, yeah. Especially when, like, I think two of the shots were Bufflin. So, you know, and he can wire it. So yeah. I wouldn't want to be in front of that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. Well, we're going to be launching a new feature on the podcast here. As we're moving out of this road stand and into the home stand, we're hoping that some of our listeners are going to have something that they want to contribute. So we're going to be doing a a kind of test over the next couple weeks to see if uh, we can get some great feedback from you guys in the form of almost like a voicemail, but through the internet. So if you go to firesidechat.ca slash conversation, or if you just go to firesidechat.ca and on our main menu, roll over podcasts in the menu and you'll see join the conversation pop up and if you go to that page um, you'll have to do it through your computer you can't phone a phone number but if you have a microphone attached to your computer or built-in laptop mic we'd love for you to leave us a voice message Uh, they can be up to 90 seconds in length and we're hoping over the next couple weeks that we can play some of what you guys are thinking so as you're watching the games this week as you're cheering on the flames if you've got something you want to share Jump over to our website, leave us a message, and we'd love to hear from all of you guys. Yeah, any questions, comments, you name it, we'll listen. 
Yeah, if you want to ask us a question um, about the show, about the Flames. Anything. If you just have a comment on the Flames, we want to hear from you guys. So uh, join the conversation, be part of the show, and let's see if we can get some great uh, Calgary Flames fans to to interact with us over the next couple weeks. As always, we're also available on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast on Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Have a good week. Go Flames Go. Hopefully we got a bunch more wins to talk about next week. Take care. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca. 